It's a pleasure to welcome to the program today Rachel Bittekoffer, who is an election forecaster and analyst and a senior fellow at the Niskanen Center. Uh, Rachel, it's so great to have you on. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So let's get right into it. So I I've sort of intuitively suspected for some time that at least as a strategy for winning elections, convincing people to change their minds about who they're going to vote for is less efficient than just finding people that agree with you and getting them to go out and vote. And you wrote a piece uh, a little while ago where you are, as I understand it, essentially supporting the idea of a turnout strategy rather than rather than a debate and change people's minds strategy being a key to winning elections. Am I correctly interpreting your perspective and talk a little bit about how you formed this idea? Yeah, I mean, you are, and it's it's precipiced on this idea of a changed electorate, right? So this idea that in the age of polarization, it's exceedingly difficult to get people to change their minds, um, and that we have a much better and more sophisticated understanding of um, electoral behavior and, and voter opinions than we did back in the days. Um, it certainly doesn't advocate for an either or. I'm not a either or or black or white individual in any uh, c capacity of my life or my research. So I'm not saying you ignore um, persuasion. I, I would argue it's probably most effective amongst that small group of pure independents, uh, even probably would argue its efficacy against, um, like if you're a Democrat trying to get an independent that leans towards Republicans to vote for you would be a stretch, let alone a, a self-identified Republican. Um, but um, so I'm not saying you shouldn't do persuasion at all. But, um, you know, until recently, Democrats pretty much engaged in almost entirely devoting their resources towards persuading, uh, you know, spending GOTV money and their ad strategy and their messaging and framing over this idea of convincing voters of the other party or uh, voters that don't agree with them to vote for them. And I am arguing that they neglected to consider shaping the electorate in their image the way that the Republicans have. How have the Republicans done it and what sorts of strategies work or can you use to do that? Yeah, so the way that Republicans have done it primarily is through effective, you know, research based um, messaging strategies. So when you look at how a Republican run, uh, like a Republican run campaign talks to voters, like they kind of meet the voter where they are. And uh, you can't say that Democrats are as good at that. Um, and it's not a flattering place where the American voter is, unfortunately. Uh, Americans are not particularly civically minded or engaged. Even the part that is engaged in elections tend to be um, you know, pretty poorly informed. So, um, you know, Democrats tend to have an idealized version of voters. They tend to think that voters want a very wonky policy-based discussion, um, you know, and, and hit them with these types of mailers that are, you know, pointing out, well, Republicans want to do this with, you know, abortion funding and we want to do that. Whereas Republicans are talking to voters' emotions. And the reason that they do that, number one, is because people are better motivated by emotions. But number two, uh, you know, if you were talking to somebody who doesn't have a great understanding of policy, it's probably because they don't have much interest in it, right? And so if you are hitting them with these wonky, you know, heavily word Latin um, policy appeals, they're going to tune out pretty quickly. You want to hit them in um, a way that resonates with them and conveys that information pretty um, quick. So um, Republicans really do certain techniques I'm happy to get into like specific details about that um, are much more effective at getting up through to that less inclined, less civically engaged voter. Now, my instinct is that this works better with some issues than with others in the sense that there are issues that naturally lend themselves more to a more sort of visceral. I've got to do something about that sort of reaction. Is that also a part of it, which is figuring out what is a voting issue in the first place? Yeah, I mean, there, that's true, right? I mean, for, to some degree, uh, you can't, to some degree, you can't create salience, but I'll push back at that a little bit too, because I mean, think about Benghazi, right? Yeah. They, uh, how many Republicans did you run into in 2016 that would point to, especially the ones that were like a little bit less Trump, like woohoo, Trump, and they would say, well, yeah, but Benghazi. 
right? I mean, just the fact that they could name Benghazi as a main, main issue is a testament to how much you can actually push and mold public opinion and voter like salience if you are effective at it and you know what you're doing. Because but I wonder, I wonder, was the Benghazi refrain actually about Benghazi or was it the emotion of being repelled by Hillary and simply finding something to say about it? Yeah, I mean, yes and no. But like, I mean, it's such a niche issue. But yet I still I still run into people who say, well, I voted for Trump and I had to because of Benghazi. Mm. <laughs> I mean, like Democrats would tell you that such a thing would be impossible to do. Right. <laughs> so, you know, so, so so the answer is you need to have the right issue. It needs to be an issue that resonates with people. But then you need to talk about it in the right way. So like um, the, Democrats will talk about health care. Um, but they don't make it about life and death. I mean, sometimes they do. And I think they're getting better about conveying, you know, if Medicaid expansion doesn't pass, this kid with pre-existing conditions is going to die. Right. That's how Republicans would talk about Medicaid expansion. If we don't pass this thing, you're going to die. <laughs> right? And Democrats don't want to take it to that level of stakes. Right. But that, that's how. Um, you know, Republicans, everything is life or death. Uh, if you don't, you know, vote for a Republican in, in 2019 in Virginia, they're going to take your guns away. It's not they're going to make modest reforms to the gun laws that make it so that you have additional hurdles to clear for a gun purchase. It's, you know, they're going to take all your guns. <laughs> right. And so it's, it's, it's a twofold problem that Democrats have identifying the right issues. And, and, you know, frankly, sometimes they're decent at that, but talking about them in a way that for you and me, we're, campaigns are not about us. Campaigns are about those people that don't give a poop um, about politics, about policy. And the reason is that nobody has, has explained to them uh, how important that policy is to them personally, the stakes that those things have for them. And, um, you know, we, um, uh, I would say, or I would argue Democrats tend to make campaigns that are already designed to talk to voters that are, care about politics. So using this model and applying it to the 2020 election pre coronavirus first, and then we'll talk about maybe what's going on now. How would you have assessed the likely outcome of the election on this basis before the virus? Well, so, you know, I mean, if you're familiar with my research, you know, I put my forecast out for the presidential election before the virus. I mean, months and months before. Yes. And then I posted an update based on the conclusion of the Democratic primary, which, you know, for me as a trained political scientist with an expertise in presidential nominations, knew was a mathematical certainty after the Super Tuesday contest. And so I updated my forecast based on the conclusion of the Democratic primary and, and the, um, you know, know, an inevitability that Joe Biden would be the nominee. Um, and I talked a little bit about how I uh, could not yet account for effects for the pandemic and the economic collapse that's going to accompany it, but also said that I'm not sure that it's going to matter all that much. And in the uh, forecast for Congress that I released tomorrow, so, you know, shameless plug, my congressional forecast that's been long awaited and much anticipated is going to be dropped tomorrow. Yes. Um, ho hold on, getting interrupted by a kid, which is like, you know, quintessential pandemic. At such uh, a key but. moment as well. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, baby. I'm on TV right now. Um, the, um, you know, the Congress forecast is going to talk. OK, now we're further a month further down the road. And, and like I anticipated, the pandemic has not moved a public opinion about Donald Trump at all. Right. Like we are a public that is completely incapable of responding to massive political stimulus because of uh polarization and hyper partisanship, you know, so um, so when you ask me, you know, is it going to be before or after? There's not going to be much difference, to tell you the truth right now. And, and, and where do you see it then? Yeah. And, and that forecast, uh, you know, anticipates a very good election cycle for Democrats, uh, given that Democrats and, and independents, uh, especially, you know, um, left leaning independents, of which there are a great deal of. Uh, and especially in this audience, I would, uh, um, um, I guess, because, um, you know, when we think about who are independents, they're disproportionately younger 
voters and they're disproportionately white, right? Um, you know, demographically. Um, but anyway, left leaning independents and also pure independents of so people who don't lean, who broke for Trump in 2016, but my research uh, predicts will probably vote in favor of the Democrat in this cycle. Um, and I think the, the one area that, that the forecast might change a little bit is I think that that Trump's problem with pure independence has probably been compounded by the pandemic uh, and the economic collapse because he is not a great leader as, you know, objectively, you know, if you were to say, okay, how is Trump handling the crisis? And you let, laid out a set of, of metrics that you would want a leader to meet in terms of this particular crisis and the things that internationally, luckily, this is a crisis that we can do that with because it's a crisis that the world shares, right? So you have a set of objective standards that are put forward by health uh, policy professionals um, and the United States is failing very poorly, uh, faring very, fairly poorly at these standards objectively. And I think that is going to probably impact that pure independent voting block a little bit in the uh, election. Now, in terms of, of Trump's um, approval not being affected, it does look like, according to the Gallup tracking poll, we saw the largest um, decline in approval between take, so to speak, a nine point decline, which we've not seen during the presidency, it's still within the same range, right? It's still not a new number that we haven't seen before, but the the precipitous decline seems novel. It, but you don't really think that it's moving dramatically in a, in a substantive way. Yeah. So another advantage I think that I can bring to forecasting and, and election analysis is that I am, I believe, the only forecaster anyway and like race handicapper that also doubled as a as an active and, um, you know, really experienced pollster. So I spent five years running uh, polls, many, many, many polls. So I'm a very well versed in polling methodology. And uh, so it pains me to say that something has been going weird in the Gallup poll for mm. the last couple of years, really. Um, and I haven't been uh, including it. I'm, um, I do a very different model than, uh, you know, the, tr the traditional method uh, used by Silver and, and many of the other analysts is to throw every poll into a model because, you know, oh, it will, uh, the noise will get canceled out if you just aggregate them all. Whereas like I am actually a very snobby poll digester. Uh, I do want more than one poll. I'm not um, big on one poll, but I also will not include polls that seemed um, that have certain methodologies that have you know, low end sizes. Like, I mean, basically if the poll has a low end size, I don't even look at the results of it. So, yes. you know, I, at some point we'll put out like a guide to poll watching um, for people to follow because actually it's just astounding to me like how many really, like really big name people use polling data in a way that is actually statistically inappropriate. So, you know, polling is interesting. But yeah, so when we look at Trump's polling data using, you know, decent data, what we will see is that there was a two or three point rally around the flag effect. Yes. And the untrained eye during that week of this um, was like, oh, look, Trump has a rally around the flag effect. He's getting more popular. But a trained eye looked at it, mine, and said, oh, God, look at this. Like, this is the most amazing muted um, rally around the flag effect we've ever seen in presidential politics. Um, it's completely atypical. We should see a 10, 15, 20. I mean, really, like for this crisis, this type of crisis, something that's completely externally caused, it's, you know, what we would call without blame. I mean, at least in the beginning, when the before the public begins to realize, you know, the decision making in the early process. Um, uh, external crisis started outside of the country's borders, um, something that we would have expected prior to polarization, a 20 point rally around the flag effect for. And the fact that he bare, I mean, basically did not get one is a real testament uh, both to how unpopular he is personally, but also to how powerful polarization and hyperpartisanship are in American politics right now. And, um, you know, I'll be talking quite a bit about this in this congressional forecast that comes out tomorrow. So on the radio, TV show and podcast, we're going to go to a break, but we'll have our, our full conversation with Rachel on the YouTube channel. So looking back at presidential approval, 
with George W. Bush, for example, at 9-11, his approval went to close to 90. At the start of the Iraq war, it went to 71. And that was not a, a situation we had no control over. It was a decision and a choice to go to war. So those would be the data points you would compare to and say the three or four points Trump got is just very small in comparison for a rally around the president. Yeah, I mean, personally, I consider it a non-effect. A non-effect. OK, fair yeah. enough. Yeah. So let me ask you this. Um, there. There are a lot of people who email me and who have e been emailing me throughout the primary saying only X candidate, if they were to be the nominee, could defeat Donald Trump in November. And typically the sort of uh, names that are included there were either Bernie Sanders, Andrew Yang or Tulsi Gabbard. Those were the three whose followers seemed more likely to email me and say this is the only person that can beat Trump. Would your analysis be fundamentally different if, for example, Bernie Sanders were the nominee instead of Joe Biden in this particular case? Yeah. So here's where the Sanders nomination was would be different is that Democrats are not Republicans. So when Donald Trump um, executed a hostile ideological takeover and his takeover, I mean, it was kind of weird, right? It's It's got elements of a far right takeover, but it's also nationalist and it's also populist. And it, it forced the party into positions they had never before considered. And, um, you know, also, it, you know, forced them into some very you know, uh, problematic positions on race and, and things like that. Um, but, you know, with Sanders, had he won the nomination, it would have been via a, probably a brokered convention uh, because of the, um, as it played out anyway, he didn't, he wasn't winning big, um, you know, delegate count right. um, contests, right? And so what would have happened in my estimation is, Democratic, um, you know, other candidates running in the Senate, running in the House would have freaked out because they don't have the. I'm so sorry. Uh, Gabe is uh, going to have to get kicked out of here real quick. Gabe. Sounds like looks like it's snowing in there all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> Hold on a second. Gabe, I need you to leave. Come on. Come on. Out. Yeah. You were fine until you started drilling. Okay. Yeah. Come on. Go get dad and he was not on TV. All right. <laughs> we all have to roll in the agent. Yes, uh, indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so anyway, um, you know, with with my estimation is I think what would have happened is the Republicans, too, they would have been very shrewd in, in pushing this. The party's establishment is convinced. And I know the Sanders crowd is convinced it's about corporatism and um, corruption. But I, I it actually comes from a, a genuine belief that a Sanders type candidate would not win election. And that's because, um, you know, these um, you know candidates and the, the party's mainstream uh, consulting class and election class is wholeheartedly convinced that their path to electoral winning must run through conversion of Republican voters for some reason. Right now, Republicans don't have to somehow win election ever by converting Democrats. And there's more Democrats, but somehow Democrats must win office by converting Republicans. Uh, and because of that, then, if you have a nominee who's a self-described socialist, then you have sentenced yourself to electoral loss, right? So what That's they, the claim they, from some, in other words. Yes. Right. But no, it's not a claim. It's a deep-seated belief, yes. right? They all believe it. So yes. it's not about corporatism or defending the corporate structures and the elites. I mean, you know, what it is is about, okay, they think that Bernie Sanders is unelectable and that by putting him on the ticket, they would be sentencing, you know, the party to four more years of Trump and costing all these other candidates their races. And they believe that Sanders, uh, people listening to this just as deeply as you believe the things that you believe. Okay. So, you know, if you can put yourself into another person's shoes, that's uh, really important because you, that will help you understand my next point. My next point is because they have that deep seated belief, what they would do, and they're not Republicans. So they're not, they're not the kind of people that will say, okay, you know, this is the guy, though, that we've been handed. And the only way that we can have any shot of winning is to stay um, in line, basically. Right. The Republican Party did, you know, in some ways fracture at times around Trump. You had the Access Hollywood video came out and Republicans were like, oh, I'm not going to, you know, he should step out. And we had some moments where the party um, freaked out. 
But by and large, elites did coalesce around him. Now they didn't, they didn't, you know, go to the convention and endorse him and give speeches on his behalf. But they didn't fight him. Right. And they did not run against their own party. So like the Democratic campaign would have played out in 2018, where like Mark Kelly in Arizona, for example, would have been running two campaigns at once. He would have been running a campaign against Trump which is a referendum campaign that's very effective and is the one that my model predicts Democrats will win, okay? Problem is, he would also be running a campaign against socialism and Republicans would artfully, because they're so much better at strategy, be um, forcing and tricking him into devoting as much time and resource into that campaign as possible because that's a campaign Republicans think that they can win, A, and B, that's a campaign that diverts resources and attention away from the campaign Republicans know they will lose, which is a referendum on Trump. Okay? okay, so let me make sure I understand that. So if Bernie were the nominee and you had today Mark Kelly running against Martha McSally in Arizona, Mark Kelly would be running against Martha McSally as a referendum on Trump with because McSally is more of a, associated with Trump. But simultaneously, Kelly would have to be distancing from the Bernie Sanders model of Democratic, yes, right. As okay. a, not as not as a Democratic. So like, so remember when I said that people make the mistake of assuming everyone's like them. Yes. And here, if you're listening to this po- um, you know, show in any capacity, I have really great news for you. You're in the one percent, mm. not the economic one percent. Okay, you're in the politically engaged like into intellectual 1%. And that means that you are a particularly terrible frame of reference by which to judge anything about other people because you are the creme de la creme. You are the smartest, most engaged, most passionate and most interested like American voter out there. You could probably tell me 10 maybe 20 of the Democratic candidates that ran in this primary where the modal American voter and not even the ones that sit out the elections, but the one that will actually vote in November can only tell me maybe Biden, Warren, uh, Klobuchar, Buttigieg and Sanders. That would be the extent of the repertoire of like your average, you know, blue or white collar. So non-college educated or college educated average American. Okay, like that. So we are not good people to think about how how average, like the average bell curve of the electorate does things. And so so that's where Bernie like the the, this is where I have argued progressives actually had a moment here in this cycle that was that they had a really a good moment for the message, but they had a really problematic messenger because the party is so is so spooked about people who have the specific label of socialist and Bernie has so much video that you know it, that it was very easy to spook these um, mainstream candidates into thinking that he, they would get dragged down by his candidacy. So so if you're asking me like my forecast tomorrow that people are gonna really want to look at yes would would look different if Bernie Sanders was going to be the nominee because a, he would be getting that nomination sometime now in August by a brokered convention, assuming this pandemic still happens. In other words, he'd be earning it, having earned a plurality of the delegates, winning the most out of everybody, but not a majority enough to secure the nomination. And that does not indicate consensus, right? In the party. And number two, because I would assume that the party would spend as much time running against itself as running against Trump because of the socialist problem. Now, it's possible that Democrats, especially, you know, having my research publicly available, uh, where I make this point clear, and I've been making this point clear for about two years, that the danger isn't so much the candidate as it is the party's belief that the candidate is unelectable. But, um, you know, my assumption is, yes, that, you know, that division of message would probably cost them, you know, you know, some electoral ground. Yeah. 
Rachel, it's an absolute pleasure to talk to you, and we will be very uh, uh, excitedly awaiting that uh, assessment tomorrow. We've been speaking with Rachel Bidikoffer, who's an election forecaster, analyst, and senior fellow at the Niskanen Center. Rachel, really appreciate your time today. Thanks so much for having me, and, and please follow me on Twitter. I do a lot of everyday commentary there. So.